welcome to the Great Big Book Club, uh, Heather Morris. All I can say is 47 languages, 6 million copies. You are probably one of the world's best-selling writers of all time. It is a joy and a pleasure to have you on the site. Oh, thank you so much, Imogen. Look, the pleasure's all mine, trust me. And I do appreciate uh, you finding the time to have this chat with me. So exciting. So you are best known, obviously, for the tattooist of Auschwitz and uh, Silka's Journey. But now you've got a new book, a third one for us, um, called uh, Stories of Hope. Could you tell us a bit more about it and the idea behind the non-fiction book? Oh, look, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. And hi, folks. Stories of Hope. This is a, a book that, well, my publishers said to me, this is the book you were born to write. So let me try and see if I can expand on what they meant by that. When I had the Tattooist of Auschwitz was released, within a matter of months, both the publisher and I became overwhelmed by the number of people who were writing to me. These are readers who had read the book. And over the last two and a half years now, that number has blown out to thousands. And even more came on board when Silke was, was printed. Now those letters they write to me, look, they weren't just writing to say to me, thank you for writing this amazing book. I've learned something about the Holocaust I didn't know. So many of them were sharing part of their lives and they were sharing something often tragic and traumatic that had happened to them. And they were following that up by saying, having read about Lully and Gita and Silka and the others, you have now, through them, given me hope that I can go on, I can get through what is going on in my life right now, which in many cases, I would mention to me, people were wanting to reconsider whether or not they wanted to continue living. I mean, that's how powerful these emails were to me. And I was reading them and I found that when I read them, I wasn't just seeing the words, I was hearing the person behind them. And I was listening to the words, even though I was reading them myself. And I mentioned that to uh, my wonderful publishers one day and they went, yeah, you're listening because that's what you do. And we started talking about all the listening I've done in my life and I've done quite a bit. Um, and it started, of course, with actually not being listened to as a child. And that's what this book covers. It, I do actually take you back to my childhood. Well, it's, it's and, very interesting, Heather, because it's part memoir, isn't it? It's part memoir. It's part sort of self-help in a sort of odd way. You do give people, uh, you know, um, tactics and things that, and exercises, or more or less, that they should practice. And it's also partly your story behind the writing of, uh, of the tattooists of Auschwitz. How do you plan it? Because the beginning is very uh, prescient. I mean, it opens with, uh, with the pandemic. Well, yes, look, and I had actually written this book way before the pandemic. It was all finished before the pandemic came and hit us. I originally wrote the introduction just to include it. It just seemed appropriate. But even then when I wrote that, which would have been back in, I think, March, um, maybe April at the latest, we still had no idea what we would be subsequently facing everywhere. And I'm, I'm even getting amazing emails from people in countries where the pandemic has hit really, really hard. And um, yeah, some of those are just overwhelming. But yeah, it's, um, it's only part of memory, okay? There's only so much about me I'm going to tell you. But um, I do share that those early childhood days of mine, not with my family per se, but just with one member of them. Your grandfather. I, my great grandfather, actually. Okay. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I think some. I considered I lived in a household where I actually wasn't listened to at all, but that was time and place, wasn't it? And small town New Zealand, children were to be seen and not heard. But I did have this one person in my life who actually did take the time to not only listen to me, but teach me how to listen to others. And he, was, he, was, he sounds a delightful character, and he's got an obsession with persimmon, which... Uh, which uh, <laughs> I, I had to look up because I didn't know what that looked like. And then I realized I've got some in my garden. <laughs> what? Yes. Well, there you go. 
Well, I can tell you, when they're getting really ripe, which is the only way to eat them, they have got to be so ripe, they're almost rotten, um, then the birds love them. So if you're planning on eating any of them, you get them early and get them quick, or do what my great-grandfather did, which is to tie strings and bells around the tree, and every time a bird went near it, you know, to, to rattle the bells and scare them off. But, that's, but that sounds like a very formative relationship uh, for you, the, your relationship with your great-grandfather. Oh, absolutely. As I say, um, I didn't feel that I, I got that kind of connection with uh, the more immediate members of my family. And, you know, one of the amazing things about writing this book and going back and, and sharing some of those stories is that um, I have given my siblings, my brothers, my three surviving brothers, I've given them advanced sort of copies of the manuscript saying, hey, listen, I don't want to sort of you know, blow you out of the water here. This is what I'm writing. What do you think? And uh, the, the three that uh, are still with us, all back saying, we were so jealous of your relationship with Gramps. It just wasn't fair. He had no time for us. It was all you. All right. And you just don't appreciate that when you're living it. And, um, and as we started sharing our experiences now as very mature adults, we realized that there was so much we actually did not know about the other one, the other sibling. It was really, really quite scary. Really? That happened to you? I don't remember that. Um, but in, your, but in your book, you're basically asking us as the reader uh, to pause and, and stop and listen to the world or the universe or the clo those people closest to you because otherwise you miss out on so much. You do. And part of that has also come from the many, many people I meet when I go out and I do speak in public who say to me, uh, I wish I'd listened or spoken to my grandparent or my great grandparent or a significant older person in their lives. So much regret out there, guys. So much regret. Well, yeah, maybe I'm just going to give you a few hints at how not to end up living with that regret. It's never too late as long as that person's still on this earth. And what is also fascinating for me as a, as a writer is you then talk about your process in this book, about how you, how you interviewed uh, Lali Sokolov, uh, the original tattooist of Auschwitz, uh, and how you found him and how you slowly but surely got him to unwrap himself and sort of reveal all his secrets to you and what's interesting is, is that also I was a journalist how unjournalistic your, your process was <laughs> um, absolutely and I think that's the only way I was able to actually get the story imagined by not being a journalist because I had no time constraint on me and I had well I had no knowledge of how to write anything I, mean, I was I was a newbie and so to me, it became a matter of, I met this man, I enjoyed his company, I started to realise that I was spending time with living history, I knew he wanted to tell a story, didn't know how to do that, and there were parts where he would just start to tell me something and then stop again, and then I'd realise, okay, slow it down, and, um, and then do the only thing I could think of to try and get him to, well, really trust me and that was to introduce him to my family. Let him get to know me, because having me sitting in his lounge room talking to him didn't tell him anything about me as a person. Yeah, he now knows, well, he got to know way too much because my family spilled the beans. And he also took, seemed to take a particular time to shine to your gorgeous daughter. Yeah, he did, the little flirt. Um, <laughs> But, but look, I actually saw him flirting with every female that he, that he subsequently met or took me to meet. But yes, and uh, when I first challenged on, on him on it, the first time he, I saw him, and uh, it was actually the first day he met her, and he just put his head down and then lifted it up again and looked at me and said, she the same age Gita was when I met her. Well, didn't I feel like an absolute heel? Yeah, that's what it was about. Well, part of it, the, the next two and a half years of him flirting with her, that was something different. <laughs> so funny. It's so funny. But also what's interesting about your process is you didn't record him. You didn't write down any notes. And I mean, 
So that you must have had to concentrate so hard. It must have been exhausting, actually, to uh, because because you have to remember every single thing that he's saying to you, and then you then you went home and wrote them all down. Ah, Imogen, that's called active listening. That's what it's all about. When you do shut up and listen, you do retain. And uh, yeah, no recording. I knew that if I started writing notes, that, that would be a distraction to him. You have to remember, this is a man who was 87, 88 years of age and uh, grieving terribly for the love of his life who had recently died in distraction. The one or two times I said, hang on a minute, what did you mean by that? That was enough of a distraction to put him off. And I thought even having a machine or some kind of device recording would still be a distraction to him. And, and I think I was quite right. But um, yeah, that flying home and given that he was saying words and often in a language which I didn't understand. And there was a lot of phonetic spelling of a lot of German names and places. And he, and he specifically chose to tell you his story rather than anybody else because you were, you were not Jewish and you had no baggage. Yeah, pretty much. Though I have to think of, um, he had have met somebody else after me, recently after me, who also wasn't Jewish and he got on with immediately, then um, I may not have had this journey with him. But yes, him, there could not be a Jewish person alive who wasn't touched by the Holocaust. They would have a family story and how could they tell his when they had their own? Well, I have to say though, Heather, you've also had quite a traumatic story yourself. I mean, towards the end of the book, you talk about uh, what your life was like in the na neonatal ward. Uh, where you worked, which sounds absolutely uh, extraordinary. Yeah, look, I do touch on that. And um, or yeah, I thought long and hard about how much of my work life of uh, you know, 20 years in a hospital that I, I did want to mention. And uh, it, it occurred to me and to, to, to the publishers and editors that my role working in, with the perinatal loss program at the hospital well, it was too significant a part of my life to leave out. So I just give you a little touch of it because, um, yeah, that, that was something that you kind of, you know, it feels weird to say that I'm privileged to have been able to spend time with people at this horrific time in their lives, you know, losing a newborn baby. Um, but yeah, being able to occasionally make a difference with them, getting through that, I decided, well, I'll tell you a little. But it seems to me that, that what you value, so you basically worked in the social work department of the, of the hospital, and uh, was your role as a counsellor then? No, I wasn't. Um, I was the uh, office manager, the administrative person that was involved with the, there was what, close to 30 social workers in the department. And so my role was to support and help each and every one of them. But then other parts of it, clinical parts of it, got woven into it. Um, and yeah, it just turned out that, um, yeah, I think my boss used to call me you're the occasional counsellor. But it's, uh, it, was, it was happening every day to me automatically as I connected with people. But it sounds to me like you understood, you learned then during that process of grief, which was the, the power of silence, because you said yeah. there were many times when people whose children or babies had just died and what they really wanted was just somebody to be there, not somebody to have a conversation with. Oh, absolutely. And uh, always knowing when to speak up and when to just stay silent. Uh, yeah, you learn that, and you learn that by reading the other nonverbal views that are being given to you from, from the couple, generally, that, that you're with. Um, yeah, it's just something that you, you pick up and you learn and you put into practice. And you know, I like to think 99.9% .9 of the time I got it right. You tell a very heartbreaking story within, uh, within your brilliant book um, about, the, about the, uh, the family who had two marbles. The blue marble and the yellow marble. Um, you know, that's one of the, the stories of my time there that just is so vivid and, and of course can never be forgotten because it was so powerful and beautiful and tragic, but beautiful again. 
So yeah, I, th I picked that as the one of, I could have written about hundreds and hundreds. But it's a story about, about a, uh, a couple who, who lose a, a child who is a, a boy and he's got two marbles that he'd been given by yeah. his father as a child to play with. Well, yeah, the dad, um, the day of the funeral, because we held a public funeral service for these babies each month that I've sort of um, administered and ran and was involved with. And the dad uh, came to me on the day of the funeral. And uh, this happened uh, probably more times than it should have, because by that point, you know, the coffins were often, they were always sealed, but often people would bring things on that to the funeral and not have to frantically go and arrange to put them in. Anyway, this dad um, was after the service and, I was talking to him and his, his wife and I could hear this click, click, clicking going on. And in the end he did, he pulled two marbles out of his pocket. He said, these were the first two marbles my father ever gave me. He said, um, I've played in marbles all my life. I lost many, he said, but I never ever put these two up uh, as a stake in any of the games that I played. I, I played marbles so I knew exactly what he was talking about. And um, he said to me, would I take one and put it with his son? And um, yeah, look, I just reached into his hand and the one was blue and one was yellow. And for reasons I didn't know at the time, I plucked out the blue one, probably because I was associating it with the fact that it was a, a baby boy. And, um, and I arranged to have that put with his baby in his coffin. And um, yeah, gosh, it was a little over a year later that he burst into my office and... I recognised him immediately, and uh, there he was to tell me and show me the pictures of his, his little baby girl who'd been born about two or three hours earlier. And he pulled out the yellow marble and his, and he said, "I've still got it." Such an amazingly powerful story. Do you think um, that because you had this background, that the reason why the tattoos of Auschwitz and also Silka's story are so so poignant is because you uh, you're you're good at listening to other people's stories. Look, I imagine there's an element of that, and uh, particularly with Lully's story, I think there's a huge element of the fact that I've never written anything before, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I didn't know how to write, and uh, my wonderful publishers, after trying to get me to write it as a memoir, and trying to get me to write it in the third person finally just sort of shook their heads and said, why don't you tell the story you want to tell? And gave me full permission to write in very simple language and um, what essentially is, I still think, a, a simple story. But you, but you also insisted at uh, the beginning that you were going to write a screenplay, which, uh, yeah. which so, so Tattoos of Auschwitz was actually written originally as a screenplay. Uh, and then you saw the error of your ways. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while though. Um, yeah, I did, as I said, I didn't know how to write a book and uh, I had uh, been going to a few weekend workshops and online courses because I decided I was going to write the next great movie. And um, I quite like the whole formula of writing a screenplay because it is very formulaic. It has rules and, uh, and regulations. And so yes, and I said to Lally, I'm going to write it as a screenplay. And, Look, it took him months and months and months of every time I went to see him, the first thing he would say to me was, have you finished my book yet? And I'd go, no, Lally, and I'm writing a screenplay. Uh, and then for a long time, he would then follow that up with, hurry up, I need to be with Gita. But um, finally one day I said that, and he, he kind of looked at me and went, well, what's a screenplay? It had to be a good nine, ten months of me saying this two to three times a week. You finally ask the question. And so I said to him, well, because I want to see your story as a film. That's how I can see it being played out. And he got so excited. A movie? You're going to make a movie about me? And I went, well, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, but you know, we're not there yet. Now he immediately jumped to, well, who will play me? And uh, when I pointed out, look, I have no idea. We're not there yet. And he went, Brad Pitt, you get me Brad Pitt. He's a good looking boy and I'm a good looking boy. I pointed out to him that Brad was actually too old, but um, we then had the most amazing, I suppose it was good three, four, five months, where every new release movie that came out, we had to go and see. 
he wanted to find the perfect person to play Lolly Sokolov. Now, it also helped immensely that said daughter of mine was working at a local, well, quite a big theatre um, multiplex. And so for him, having her organise our seats and seeing her and having coffee with her before we went to the movies, uh, it was an extra little bonus for him. And um, yeah, the you know, actor after actor, he just shook his head and roll his eyes at me and say, what are you thinking? He finally found the one. He oh, found the one. Which one did he find in the end? He wanted to play him. Ryan Gosling. Ah, oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, look, um, and, and it was in the, the amazing movie, the beautiful movie, which I wonder if it have played a part in it, called The Notebook. So at that point in time, Ryan Gosling was the perfect age to play Lily Sokolov, even though having him stand up in a theatre and point to people and loudly call out, you down the front, turn around and look at me. Don't you think he looks like me? <laughs> yeah, no, Lily, he's 20-something, you're knocking 90. <laughs> It didn't matter. Oh, it sounds like you really miss him. I do. I do, every day. It must be yes, yes, a uh, very important friendship. It was. And, um, you know, it, we were friends, he and I and my family, up until the, literally the day he died. And I was with him a couple of hours before he died. Just him and I. And I knew he wasn't going to see the sun come up the next day. And it was a matter of me just saying to him the last words that I would never, ever stop trying to tell your story. And uh, there it stayed as a screenplay until I was visiting my brother and sister-in-law in California. I think that must have been about 2015. So you watch, you know, good nine or 10 years after he died. And my sister-in-law had had enough of me complaining about, you know, those characters up 100 miles up the road was Hollywood. Wouldn't know a decent story if it hit them over the head. And she just looked at me one night and she said, oh, for goodness sake, write the bloody thing as a book and get on with it. Well, that was my light mulled moment to try and write a book. That's brilliant. And so what is happening with the screenplay? Because it has been optioned, hasn't it, obviously? Yes, a UK company, um, a six-part miniseries in development. <sighs> Currently filming being held up by you know what. Yeah, well, so at least Lally lives on is the, is the point of, of all of this. Oh, absolutely. Not only in the book, but um, yeah, he will be not on the big screen, but the little screen. But that's fine. That's perfect. That's perfect. So going, going back to uh, the book that you're, that, you're, that you're publishing at the moment, um, you've got lots of sort of tips for listening for children and listening to ourselves. So just before we go, could you just give us a few of your the most important tips that you think that, uh, that uh, we should hold on to in this present time? Well, for any of you who have got an elderly person in your life who you've heard bits about their life, and I'm not saying that you want to get their story from them so that you can write a novel, but you may want to get it so that you can write it down for your family. And I think that's incredibly important and, and I regret that I didn't do this to my own father, for example, um, uh, because he did have a story worth telling. But do it, just, just find a way, and I give you some tips, find something to connect you with that person that you want to listen to. Not talk with, listen to. And it can be something as simple as a knick-knack that you've grown up with a grandmother's hat on her, a mantelpiece all her life, ask her if there's any, what's it about or significance. It's just a matter of really committing to sitting and engaging with them and giving them that freedom to, to know that you actually are going to listen. Uh, too often, I think, and, and look, I do it all the time too. I'm listening so that I can formulate my response to what you're saying. Then doing that, I'm just waiting to hear my own voice again, not yours. And we need to start to get out of that habit, I think. We do it too, all too often. So, and your elders, they're not going to be around. So they're, they're the first ones to deal with. But really right behind them, listening to children. Look, I think we did an okay job, though, when I told my three adult children that I was writing a chapter called Listening to Your Children. They all uh, proclaimed that I was not uh, qualified to write that. 
but um, I'm working on the theory that we still have pretty good damn relationships with all of them and them with each other, that somewhere along the line I did listen to them. But I did learn that, that what I talk about, two things about that what they tell you as children, if you don't think it's a big thing and you just brush over it, well, then you run the risk of them not talking to you, when, particularly when they're adolescents, and you do want them to talk to you about what's going on in their lives. Because way back when they were a toddler, that little thing to you was actually a big thing to them. Uh, and to cling to that uh, and when talking to them. And just since the book has just had some preview readings, I've heard from people who say, I'm now listening to my four-year-old. You have no idea what I'm hearing. But you also um, refer to this most brilliant book in your, in your book called Pajamas Are Not Important. Pajamas Don't Matter. I thought that was the best title for a book I've ever heard. And it was yeah. a, a, an idea about, uh, well, tell me about it. Yeah, look, somebody gave it to me when my firstborn uh, was a, a tiny, a baby. And it just totally resonated with me. And I went, yep, that's kind of my mum going to be. Uh, essentially, it says that if your child, your toddler, one night says to you, I don't want to wear my pyjamas to bed, don't fight with them. Don't make a big deal about them. Let them go to bed with nothing on, unless they're a baby and they need a nappy. Um, but, and, and just translate that all the way through their life. You know, my, my adult children say to, to me and, and their dad, they give us a hard time saying, you know, we don't think you were tough enough on us when we were growing up. Because then our parent, two of them are parents themselves. And I went, I picked my battles. I knew when pyjamas didn't matter. And it was a matter of that, and then through that you win their trust. But, yeah, what does it matter? Look, I know, I remember one of my sons going to school one day in his pyjamas because he had worn his pyjamas to bed. He was refusing to change into his school clothes. He was five or six. Um, and I went, fine. He only school ever clothes don't matter then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Heather, I mean, brilliant. What's your, do you, are you working on another book at the moment, or are you... Uh, Having a... Oh, yeah. uh, absolutely, I am. I'm going back to um, you know, Lully and Silka's stories. And uh, this amazing story came to me like so many others have. And it was a matter of choosing which one. Well, actually, this one was just so obvious once uh, it came to me. Um, and yeah, it involves three sisters and a survival against... Well, yes, it's just a start in the Holocaust, but it ends in Israel and uh, fighting as freedom fighters for the free state of Israel by three young girls, 15, 17, and 19. And is it partially based on truth uh, uh, as, as well? Oh, absolutely, all of it. In fact, two of the sisters, they're 94 and 96, and they're in Israel and they're alive, and I visit them, and I should be with them about now because I have been to them and uh, they give, their story is being given to me by them. I have spent two week-long periods in Tel Aviv with them uh, and their family, their adult children, adult grandchildren. And um, I've made testimonies of the one sister who's died. I've been, we've been given them. And we do have this amazing story of these three young girls. But absolutely, it, it is being written in the same format that I write in, historical fiction, not a memoir. It could be either or because I do have the... the the sisters whose life I'm telling, but they've asked me to write it the same way that I wrote Lully's, because when the way I got this story was being in South Africa about this time last year and coming back to my hotel one room one night and reading an email from a man who lived in Canada and was visiting his mom in Tel Aviv. And at Toronto Airport, he picked up a copy of my book. Now, my book in Canada has the same cover as it has here in Australia. It's just as black with the arms of uh, a man and a woman and the numbers tattooed on them. That's all that is. Anyway, he took that book to Israel and to his mom's house and he brought it out the next day and left it on her coffee table. She walked past and looked down at it and she said, Oh, that must be about Lily and Gita. It's all this 93-year-old had to see to know what that book was about. Her number is three away from Gita's. Her sister's number is two away from Gita's. 
They came from the same town. They knew each other as still schoolgirls. They were on the same train to Auschwitz. They remembered Lali tattooing them and Gita had visited them in Israel in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so yeah, when you hear a story like that, you think, well, okay, that's fantastic. They can add to um, my knowledge of Lali and Gita. But when I went to Israel and spent time with them, I found out that no, 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 they can, there's this story in that place, their escape from a death march, their life back in Slovakia where they were not welcomed. They're going into the forests of Czechoslovakia to train young girls to be soldiers and then being you know, hidden on a boat and getting to Palestine and becoming freedom fighters there. Well, trust me, that's a story on its own. It doesn't need to compliment anyone else's. Wow, Heather, that's absolutely extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. what's the, do you have a title for it yet? No, we don't. We just call it, I'm just calling it the girl's story. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll settle on one and uh, yes, it, it will hopefully be out this time next year. So. Well, no doubt it will um, blow everything out of the water like the other two have done and you'll sell another six million copies. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, Heather, it's been an extraordinary experience talking to you today. I am absolutely, totally blown out of the water myself. Thank you so much for coming um, on the site and good luck with the uh, stories of hope. Absolute pleasure. And maybe next time we can do it in person. I was meant to be in London right now. You realise that for the launch of the, or the release of the book. But um, I'm just waiting for a vaccine and for Qantas to get back in the air. I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to us. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Or oh, good morning. Whatever.